Hello everyone, this is Erica Podest. Welcome back to this RSET webinar series on the use of SAR for assessing disasters. Today is the second session of this three-part series. It is focused on interferometric SAR time series for landslides. Our guest lecturer today is my colleague, Dr. Eric Fielding. He's a scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and he is an expert in the use of INSAR for looking at earthquakes and landslides, amongst other things. He has prepared a great presentation and demonstration for you today, and I'm very much looking forward to it. Dr. Fueling has been a guest lecturer with RSET in the past, covering the basics of INSAR and the use of INSAR for landslides and earthquakes. I believe this is his fourth RSET presentation. Welcome back, Dr. Fueling. It's great to have you. Okay, so uh, today I'm going to be talking about how to do interferometric synthetic aperture radar time series to study landslide motion. This is a more advanced uh, webinar that's building upon the uh, previous uh, RSET webinars that we've done in the past, especially the 2019 uh, INSAR uh, seminar on landslide motion that went into more details about how to do the uh, interferometric processing using SNAP. Uh, this time we're going to be doing uh, time series analysis with interferograms that are already pre-processed, so it's a more advanced uh, seminar. So today, our learning objectives, uh, I'm going to review the basic physics of SAR interferometry and um, uh, go over the how, what the SAR interferometric phase tells us about the land surface and how landslides are moving. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the necessary data processing for doing this time series analysis of uh, SAR interferometry measurements. Uh, using pre-processed data. Um, and then we're also going to be uh, talking about how to understand what the uh, information from the interferometric uh, SAR images and time in SAR time series tell us about landslide motion. So the courses that you should really uh, look over to have a better background for this course uh, as prerequisites are the uh, Basics of Synthetic Aperture Radar from 2017, the uh, SAR data processing and analysis from 2017, and the introduction to SAR interferometry from 2017. And then the more detailed uh, webinar from 2019 on interferometric SAR um, processing of a, of a single interferogram for landslides that were uh, recorded in 2019. I've uh, worked with a, a lot of different people on different parts of this. Uh, the I should have mentioned on, on the first slide that the uh, a lot of these slides were actually uh, prepared by Alexander Handwerker, who is uh, one of the, the my close colleagues here at Jet Propulsion Laboratory, working with me on landslide analysis, and he actually did a lot of the work uh, that's uh, presented in the slides part of this uh, presentation. Uh, and, but there's these additional people at Caltech, especially uh, uh, Zhang Yunjun, who is the uh, main author of uh, the MintPy program that we're going to be using for the time series analysis. And Haresh Fatahi is also a, ma a major uh, contributor to MintPy uh, with a lot of the other uh, people that worked on uh, the ICE software, the ARIA uh, processing and um, other data sets that we've used here. And this work has been um, supported by the uh, NASA Earth Science, Earth Surface and Interior uh, Program, Geodetic Imaging Program, and the uh, NISAR Science Team Project. So I'm going to give you a, a quick uh, overview of SAR interferometry theory. Uh, if you want to go into more detail, you should really go back to those previous seminars. I'm going to try to go through it more quickly here uh, because I don't want to uh, repeat too much of what was covered in the previous uh, webinars. So 
you should really go back and get, see those other uh, webinars for more detail. The key thing with SAR interferometry as opposed to other types of SAR analysis is that we really care about the phase of the SAR uh, signal. And that's uh, going to be the, the key thing that uh, we're going to talk about here. So the SAR phase is actually uh, measured, uh, it's, a, it's, it's related to the range or the distance between the uh, radar antenna, in, which is in space for our case here, uh, or, or in an airplane, and, and the ground surface. And uh, the phase is actually not just from uh, a single object on the ground. Typically, there's within a radar uh, pixel, uh, there's actually a, a number of different uh, objects within the, the radar uh, pixel area. And the, the phase is actually some kind of integrated uh, response of uh, how all those uh, different uh, pieces of the, of the area on the ground uh, interact. Plus, uh, we have this very large distance between the radar antenna and the ground. So the number of radar wavelengths between the radar antenna and the ground is millions or even billions of, of, uh, of radar cycles. So we can never know exactly what the range is uh, in terms of phase. It's... Um, by doing a, the uh, interferometry or taking the difference between two images that we actually uh, get the details of what, uh, how the, the ground surface has moved or, or what the elevation is. Uh, so interferometry is a way of, uh, of taking the difference in the phase between two different radar observations, either with uh, two antennas, uh, on the same spacecraft or, or on adjacent spacecraft, uh, which we use to do a single pass interferometry or uh, the, uh, the re repeat pass interferometry where we do uh, a radar pass on one day and then another pass on another day um, and look at the difference in the radar phase between those two days. So um, we generally simplify the uh, radar phase to be, uh, it's actually quite a complicated uh, sum of all the, the objects within the pixel, but we can approximate that as a single phase for the, for the cell. Um, and so the, the row here, row one and row two, are the uh, range or, or distance between the radar antenna and the ground. You'll notice the lambda here. The lambda is the radar wavelength. That's a very important consideration for the radar phase because the, the phase is always inversely proportional to the uh, radar wavelength. And then you'll notice these other constants in this, uh, in this phase um, equation. And those other constants are basically uh, determined, uh, are, are controlled by the, all the distribution of uh, the objects that interacted with the radar waves within that radar cell. So we can't know that uh, in detail. So uh, the way we observe the range change is by doing interferometry and subtracting uh, the phase of uh, phase one and phase two. Uh, which is basically a way to cancel out these other constants that are, we hope are the same between the two uh, radar images. So uh, there's basically two main uh, types of interferometry applications. There's the single pass interferometry where we do uh, topographic mapping or, or cartography. Uh, this was uh, the main method that we used in the 2000 shuttle radar topography mission uh, that uh, used the space shuttle with a large antenna in the 
hold of the space shuttle and then a, a 60 meter long boom in the second antenna. So we were able to get two images of the ground surface separated by that 60 meters. And that allowed us to estimate the uh, topography of uh, the earth land area up to 60 degrees north and south within uh, one 10 day shuttle radar mission. Um, that's an example of a uh, repeat pass interferometry for topography. There's many airborne systems that do this uh, with two antennas. Uh, this is a, a widely used uh, uh, method. And then there was also the, uh, the German uh, space agency, uh, uh, Tandem X and uh, Terrasar X, where they used two radar satellites flying uh, uh, some hundred meters apart or with actually varying distance uh, to make a, a global uh, DEM using this uh, repeat pass interferometry where they use the two satellites together to measure topography. And that's uh, now available from the Copernicus program as a Copernicus DEM, uh, which is now a, a new global DEM uh, from a repeat pass, from single pass interferometry for the earth. And the big advantage of this, of course, is that it, it goes right through clouds. And uh, we, it's unlike uh, the optical imagery for making topography where you have to keep uh, going back and getting uh, cloud-free pairs of, of optical images. The other uh, main application of uh, SAR interferometry is the re repeat pass interferometry where we measure changes in the Earth's surface. And that can be uh, either uh, deformation of the Earth's surface, displacements of the Earth's surface, or uh, in some cases, uh, change detection at high resolution, uh, so, uh, such as making uh, what we call uh, damage proxy maps that are, are a way of using the interferometric uh, coherence as a measurement of how much the pixels have changed, the, the, the buildings within the pixels may, uh, if they are destroyed by a, an earthquake or a hurricane or some other uh, phenomenon, then uh, that causes the phase to be, uh, become incoherent and we can use the SAR interferometry to uh, do this change detection. Uh, also useful for, uh, deforestation maps. So the uh, the thing to remember is that uh, for displacement mapping, uh, repeat pass interferometry can measure uh, displacements on the order of uh, a millimeter to a centimeter or a few centimeters uh, accuracy, whereas the uh, elevations are measured on the order of tens of meters accuracy. So it's uh, because the deformation maps are uh, measuring the are using the phase uh, directly and assuming that the uh, topographic component is uh, is corrected, uh, we're able to, to measure a small fraction of the radar wavelength. So if the radar wavelength is uh, uh, 24 centimeters, we can measure the displacements approximately a centimeter or two. Uh, other sat radar satellites with three centimeter wavelength uh, can measure uh, the ground displacements at even uh, finer uh, accuracy. And the way we do that is by taking these two observations of the ground surface uh, with the antenna hopefully coming back uh, close to the same position, uh, which is true for a lot of the satellites that are in orbit today. Uh, then we can just take the, the phase difference between uh, the acquisition on time one and time two, and that phase difference is then proportional to the range difference, or, or which is then a direct measurement of the uh, surface displacement in the same direction as the radar uh, look direction, uh, which is what we call a line of sight. And that's therefore uh, just proportional to the uh, 
the delta rho here, or range change uh, divided by the radar wavelength uh, multiplied by four pi, just because it's two directions. That shows the uh, the sensitivity we have to uh, displacements. It's what we we'll call differential interferometry because we uh, actually have to do a, a correction for any uh, difference in the two radar antenna locations uh, due to topography if, if there is any uh, difference. Uh, so uh, as I was saying, the uh, the topographic sensitivity is dependent on this uh, distant on the is much less sensitive uh, because we have this extra term in the uh, in the equation here. Uh, the row there's a row in the um, um, denominator of the equation. That means when that's the total distance between the radar antenna and the ground and then we have this b uh, in the uh, denominator in the numerator b uh, with this uh, perpendicular symbol that's the perpendicular baseline so it's this uh, perpendicular baseline divided by the uh, total distance of the the satellite or uh, airborne system is from the ground that determines what the topographic sensitivity is and that means that we're because the the row is uh, much bigger than uh, is th hundreds of kilometers in for a satellite, uh, and the baseline is only a few hundred meters. That that means that this uh, this ratio here is much much less than one. So our sensitivity to topography is is low, and that's good news because we need to. When we have uh, INSAR pairs that are not acquired with the antenna in exactly the same present, uh, location, then we have to do a correction for the topography using topographic data from another source, uh, combined with our knowledge of the uh, baseline, uh, to correct for the topographic phase and uh, subtract that to get the uh, displacement uh, phase. The other uh, big uh, factor that's uh, uh, important for understanding a star interferometry uh, is that uh, what we actually measure is uh, what we call the wrapped phase. If we start with this actual phase here on the on the top part of this figure on the left, uh, the we if there was a phase that was uh, a linear ramp over some some distance uh what we measure is actually modulo 2 pi and that's just in the nature of measuring a phase we can only measure it uh, modulo 2 pi we can't get the the full uh absolute phase so we end up with these wrapped uh, measurements and we have to use uh computer algorithms to estimate what the unwrapped phase it was um and that can ha cause errors. Um, today, we're going to be using data that's already been unwrapped. So we're just going to be assuming that the uh, phase unwrapping was uh, was successful, and uh, we can use the unwrapped phase uh, without uh, doing our own. Uh, but we, this is a, an important source of uh, possible errors to be aware of for uh, SAR interferometry. Uh, ap applications, including especially uh, with landslides that can have uh, very large motions, uh, the phase unwrapping can be uh, extra challenging due to the uh, the large motions. The other uh, important fact uh, that's uh, part of the interferometric uh, measurements is that there is what we call a coherence, or uh, which we uh, which is how uh, the ground, the, whether the radar reflection and phase is coherent with time between the two acquisitions. Uh, we can't measure the coherence directly, so we use what we call correlation. Um, and we use uh, both uh, temporal and, uh, and spatial correlation between the, the phase measurements uh, to 
estimate what the uh, what the true coherence is. So you'll see a lot of uh, discussions in INSAR uh, papers and publications. Uh, some people use the word correlation. Other people use the word coherence. Uh, they're slightly different things. Correlation is a way of measuring the coherence. Uh, but uh, we, we really want to know the coherence, and we use correlation as, as the way to uh, measure that. And people use the word decorrelation uh, uh, for uh, the process of losing uh, coherence or, or uh, due to... Uh, changes in the uh, in the radar reflection. So the, the, there's several different processes that can cause this uh, uh, loss of coherence or, or, or decorrelation. There's just uh, the signal and noise ratio in the radar uh, system, the thermal and processor noise. There's uh, the differential ge geometry and volumetric scattering. This is very important for areas with uh, strong vegetation. Uh, when we do repeat pass interferometry uh, and uh, we're using a relatively short radar wavelength, there's a volumetric scattering within uh, the trees and the leaves uh, that causes a loss of coherence. Uh, there's some other uh, things that can happen, like if the, for whatever reason, the radar geometry is slightly rotated. And then there's uh, random motions uh, uh, within the, the radar pixel uh, that are caused by some other process, such as building damage or uh, cars moving around or whatever. Uh, if there's other things that move within the radar pixel, that, that can also cause a loss of coherence. And when the, the coherence is low, then uh, we're uh, much, much more difficult to uh, unwrap the phase correctly. And it also reduces the accuracy of estimates of uh, either topography or displacements, depending on whether we're doing uh, topographic mapping or displacement mapping. So this is an important uh, uh, part of uh, interferometric uh, measurements. And uh, the other thing to remember about INSAR correlation or, or coherence is that the correlation effects multiply. Uh, when we do have different phase effects uh, in an interferogram, those phase effects add together, so they're easier to separate, but the uh, correlation or, or coherence effects multiply uh, so that any any one of these uh, components that's low will cause the entire um, coherence to be low. So that's an important thing to remember uh, that INSAR correlation is um, a multiplicative rather than additive. The uh, correlation also depends on the radar wavelength, uh, and that's because the radar wavelength uh, determines how uh, what size of objects on the ground uh, the radar uh, is most strongly interacting with. The radar is going to be generally uh, be affected by objects that are the size of the radar, around the size of the radar wavelength. One of the main satellite uh, wavelengths that we use uh, these days is called L-band. Uh, it's 24 centimeter radar wavelength. Uh, that's a long radar wavelength that tends to bounce off of uh, the tree trunks and, and and the ground, so it's less affected by the uh, the leaves and, and small branches. C band is another uh, very widely used radar wavelength, uh, including a Sentinel One satellite, and that. Uh, is a six centimeters uh, tends to bounce off smaller branches and, and to some extent off the leaves. Uh, and then there is X band, um, which is a three centimeter wavelength, uh, which is uh, the shortest uh, wavelength generally used for, um, for most SAR satellites these days. Uh, and that there it has a much more interaction with the the smaller leaves and uh, and 
the tops of the trees. So uh, by looking at these different wavelengths, we can, if we have the three different measurements or two, two different measurements, well, we can have more information about what part of the, the ground or, or overlying uh, vegetation is reflecting the radar. And, but it, this also determines a lot about how, what the radar coherence is gonna be. So with X-band, uh, if they're returning doing uh, repeat pass interferometry, uh, the, it's very likely that the leaves on trees are gonna be in different positions when we come back even just one day later. Uh, so uh, the coherence loss uh, over vegetated areas is much faster with the shorter radar wavelengths and much slower with the uh, longer radar wavelengths. And that's uh, an important uh, part of the interpretation of uh, different radar wavelengths. And over here on the right uh, is just an example of two different uh, images of the same ground surface uh, with the, on the top here is the L band and the bottom is this the X band. And you can see there's quite a lot of different uh, differences between these two radar images. They are acquired from the same, uh, the same radar platform with the same incidence angle and everything, uh, but uh, end up with a different uh, reflection pattern uh, due to the different wavelength and what, what part of the ground and, and, and overlying surface it's, it's uh, related to. Uh, the other thing to remember with, we have very dry soils, uh, L-band actually can penetrate into the, um, into the soil, especially like dry sand to some extent. So that in some cases we can actually be getting reflections from uh, uh, deep in a in the in the radar surface uh, in, in in a soil or or sand surface, not not from the uh, from the top. Uh, that's important because uh, L band can there can sometimes become incoherent over over sandy surfaces because of the uh, uh, volumetric scattering. It's also uh, uh, one of the ways that uh, we use to measure soil moisture is to actually look because the dryness of the soil affects how the radar reflects from the surface and that's a, a, a very rapidly growing part of our radar uh, use from satellites uh, is to actually measure the soil moisture by looking at the both the the phase and the amplitude of the reflective radar that's uh, affected by changes in the in the soil moisture. And this is just an example uh, from a very uh, early uh, radar mission that we, uh, I, uh, and others at JPL worked on. Uh, is that in fact I, I came to JPL to work on the SIRC mission. It flew in 1994. It actually they flew the same radar mission twice uh, in 1994, uh, in April and October. And this, uh, the SIRC mission actually had all three radar wavelengths, L-band, C-band, and X-band uh, operated uh, simultaneously. So this is one place where we can do uh, a direct comparison between the two radar wavelengths. And over here on the left here is a, a interferogram with the wrapped phases. You can see on the left uh, is the C-band with the roughly six centimeter wavelength. And because the wavelength is shorter, we see many more fringes uh, in the areas where the ground is uh, basically without vegetation. Uh, the, and the top of the, this is from uh, Hawaii, uh, Kilauea volcano and the, and the edge of Mauna Loa. In the areas where it's bare uh, lava flows, the, the C band is quite coherent for this six month interferogram. Uh, but in the areas with uh, a dense uh, tree forests, uh, the C band becomes incoherent uh, and becomes this uh, speckle pattern, uh, which is the signature of low coherence. But the L band data for the same, over the same time interval, same baseline, everything shows that the fringes go right through those areas and that's an indication about how the L band uh, is more able to penetrate through the, the forest and get a, a 
more coherent interferometric phase even uh, uh, over a six-month time interval. And that's why we're building a new a radar, um, interferometric radar system called NISAR that I'll be talking about uh, later. And then over here on the right is uh, the interferometric co correlation or coherence estimates from these two radar interferograms, uh, where the blue means low uh, correlation and the yellow and uh, purple colors are the higher correlation. Uh, you can see that the correlation is much higher at L band than it is at uh, C band. And just we also made this map uh, using a, a vegetation index, normalized difference vegetation index from Landsat data to compare with the uh, INSAR coherence. And you can see there's a very high uh, similarity between the uh, the vegetation index and the coherence. So that's just another indication how strongly uh, coherence is determined by uh, vegetation. Uh, for It affects the coherence of the L-band uh, to some extent, uh, and it affects the C-band coherence very strongly. And this was published in this paper in 1996, led by Paul Rosen. So uh, now we're going to talk about what uh, types of uh, SAR data available to study landslides. These are uh, some commonly used uh, SAR satellites. Uh, the European Space Agency had launched uh, two uh, European uh, radar uh, remote sensing satellites called ERS-1 and ERS-2. Uh, most of that time they were in a 35-day repeat cycle. Uh, ERS-1, the Canadian Space Agency, launched a satellite called RadarSat-1 in 1995, uh, and it op operated uh, with a 24-day repeat cycle, slightly shorter than the ERS. It was also a C-band mission, and this satellite actually uh, lasted a long time until it operated until 2013. And uh, the Canadian, uh, the RadarSat-2 satellite is still in operation uh, since two, uh, early 2008. It's another 24-day uh, repeat uh, C-band mission. The follow-on <clears throat> to ERS-1 and ERS-2 uh, from the European Space Agency was called Envisat. That satellite was launched in uh, 2003, uh, really started acquiring data in late 2003. Uh, they started uh, lowering the orbit of and they sat satellite in 2000, September 2010. So it went from a 35 day repeat to a 30 day repeat. Uh, really, the data that was acquired after uh, October 2010 is, is not very useful because they didn't, the, the nature of the new orbit was not, uh, not interferometric in most places. But we have a good seven years of data from this NVSAT satellite, which was a uh, very high quality uh, C-band satellite. The next uh, uh, satellite that's been very widely used is a L-band satellite called ALOS, the Advanced Land Observation Satellite from uh, JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency. That satellite had a 46-day repeat. And it, because this is, an, it is a 24-centimeter L-band satellite, it's a much more uh, coherent in uh, in areas of, of vegetation, but it has this long uh, repeat cycle. Uh, so frequency of, of observations is less than with some other satellites. Uh, the JAXA has uh, agreed to open up all of the ALOS data, and they've been they're almost completed the process of transferring all of the uh, raw ALOS data to the Alaska Satellite Facility in the NASA facility. Uh, so the Alaska Satellite Facility now has basically all of the ALOS data available. Uh, so that's a, a an excellent data set for for looking at L band. Uh, I mentioned earlier the German uh, space agency TerraSRX and Tandemax satellites. These are two uh, satellites that work together. They're in the same orbit. They fly uh, just a, 
uh, between 50 and, and 500 meters apart. And they, some of the time, acquire them in what they call bi-static mode, where they use the two satellites together to acquire these single-pass interferometry to make uh, uh, topographic models. They use that to make the worldwide DEM. Uh, you'll see the Tandem X DEM, or it's also called the World DEM in the commercial version. Uh, and uh, Copernicus DEM, uh, for the uh, version that's been uh, released through the Copernicus uh, program. The Copernicus DEM is at 30 meter uh, pixel spacing. There is a world DEM that's sold commercially by Airbus Defense and Space that's a, a 12 meter uh, pixel spacing. Another uh, X band. Uh, uh, Radar satellite system is the Cosmos SkyMed uh, constellation. This is a set of uh, four satellites that were launched uh, between 20, 2007 and 2010. They, uh, unlike the uh, TerraSarx and Tandemax, they uh, spaced out this, the the four satellites over the over the orbit so that they only collect a repeat pass interferometry, but they had it set up that there was a one day repeat, four day repeat, seven day repeat, eight day repeat, a, a number of different intervals uh, between the different uh, ones of the four satellites. There is some part of the Cosmos SkyMed data that's available for scientific use and other parts are, are sold for uh, commercial purposes. The big satellite these days uh, that's very widely used is called the uh, Sentinel-1 satellite. Uh, it's They launched uh, Sentinel-1A in, in April of 2014 and Sentinel-1B in, in May of 2015. Uh, the Sentinel-1B satellite uh, stopped operating in December of 2021, and uh, they've officially declared that it's uh, out of operation. They tried for many months to get it working again. Uh, Sentinel-1 is a, a C-band satellite with the six centimeter wavelength, and uh, we'll be uh, using Sentinel-1 data for the analysis that I'm gonna be demonstrating later today. And that, uh, the Sentinel-1 uh, data is all free and open. It's, uh, Copernicus uh, makes it freely available uh, and uh, they are allowing the uh, Alaska Satellite Facility to mirror the entire archive. Uh, so people in, the, in North America can get the data more quickly, generally from uh, the Alaska Satellite Facility, whereas uh, people in, in Europe can get it from the uh, European Space Agency Copernicus facilities. The uh, Japanese uh, Space Agency, JAXA, launched another uh, ALOS, a follow-on ALOS satellite called ALOS-2 in 2014. ALOS-2 satellite is a SAR-only satellite, so it doesn't, it's able to collect data all the time without uh, conflicts with the optical data like the uh, first ALOS satellite. They also changed the repeat cycle of ALOS-2 uh, from a 46-day repeat to a 14-day repeat. Uh, it's another L-band satellite, but with a 14-day repeat, uh, it has a much higher uh, frequency of, of revisit. Uh, but it also means that the radar uh, tracks, the satellite tracks are uh, much farther apart. They're about uh, 200 kilometers apart. Uh, the Indian Space Research Organization, uh, ISRO, uh, launched a, a radar satellite called RISAT-1 in 2012. They've launched another one uh, just earlier this year that's uh, called RISAT-1A. It's not on this chart. I, I didn't add that yet. Those uh, satellites have a 25-day repeat, and they're uh, C-band. And then finally, uh, the... The big thing that uh, we're working on now, the uh, the NASA ISRO SAR mission uh, that we're uh, building at uh, at JPL and at ISRO. Uh, this is a, a big cooperation between NASA and the Indian Space Research Organization. Uh, the name of the mission is NISAR, NASA ISRO SAR, and the 
planned launch is now January of 2024. We, uh, uh, this is just some more details about the NISAR mission. Um, uh, this one is, is updated for the new planned launch date. We're, uh, as I said, we were uh, testing the radar hardware at JPL as we speak. The big uh, one of the big advantages of the way that we uh, designed this uh, NISAR mission is that it's to be able to uh, be on all the time over all land. Uh, it's uh, going to have a, a huge amount of data coverage. Uh, no other uh, radar satellite is able to be operated all the time over over land. They all uh, have some limitations on the amount of area that's covered. Uh, one of the things that we decided some time ago uh, for NISAR is that it's going to be uh, uh, with the radar uh, looking to the left of the satellite track, and that means it's going to be looking southward uh, relative to uh, on the satellite track, and that means it, it will have a much better coverage of Antarctica and a little bit uh, somewhat less coverage of the, of the Arctic. All of the uh, science data will be uh, freely available uh, from NASA uh, through the Alaska Satellite Facility, and we're really looking forward to uh, you know, this mission. Uh, it's going to produce uh, huge data volumes uh, in, in just uh, about starting in about 14 months from from today, uh, and uh, the. The type of data processing that I'm going to be showing later today, this time series analysis with uh, pre-processed interferograms, uh, is uh, an analyzing uh, a data set that's uh, a prototype for the uh, for the NISAR uh, data files, and so this uh, training is uh, going to be relevant for for analyzing NISAR data when it's available in. Uh, a uh, little over a year. Uh, okay, so uh, now we're going to be talking about some examples of uh, use, applying INSAR to landslides. Uh, most of the studies that I've been doing uh, recently with my uh, colleague uh, Al Handwerger and others is uh, been landslides in California. So we're going to be talking about landslides in California. Where our demonstration today is going to be a landslide in uh, Southern California uh, near Los Angeles. Uh, these are, we're going to be looking today at uh, what we call slow moving landslides. These are landslides that move uh, gradually uh, over uh, months or, and, or years. Uh, on the right here is a landslide in Peru that's uh, been moving slowly for, uh, I think, five years or eight years. I, I forget exactly what the time interval is this on this. Um, and on the left here is a landslide that uh, was moving gradually for at least eight years that we uh, saw with a uh, airborne radar, and then suddenly had a, a catastrophic collapse in, in 2017. Uh, this is a landslide called Mud Creek, and you can see here that it wiped out this road. This is the, the main uh, coast highway uh, that goes to Big Sur and on the coast of California, and that was a, a major disaster for uh, landslides when uh, when it took out that that road. So one of the things we want to understand by looking at the uh, time series of, of landslide motion is to see whether they're going to be doing this gradual motion or uh, moving towards a catastrophic collapse. And that's why uh, the time series analysis is more uh, important for landslides. California has a big variation in precipitation uh, in, out in the Mojave Desert. It's as little as 20 millimeters per year of, of rainfall. Up in the northern northwest corner of uh, California, it has as much as 4,000 millimeters of, of rainfall, four meters of rain per year. Um, so there's a huge variation in, in precipitation in different parts of the state. And that uh, variation in precipitation also means that there's variations in the uh, landslide motion that's controlled by precipitation in, in, to a large extent. It also means that there's a variation in uh, 
vegetation cover, these areas of high precipitation are generally uh, covered with dense forests. Uh, you may uh, know about the uh, redwood forests of, of Northern California, and those are in these areas of uh, high rainfall. That's the uh, temperate rainforest uh, that's on the uh, Pacific Northwest and, and Northern California. And of course, that affects uh, insular coherence uh, because uh, there, those are up to 60, 80, even 90 meter tall trees. One of the things that uh, important about the, the precipitation in California is that it's very seasonal. We get almost all the rain between October and uh, March or April. Uh, so this is uh, precipitation just in the area of, of Big Sur at Central California. You can see uh, there's also there's a concentration in the in the winter part of the year near the boundary of the year, um, and there's a, a variation between one year and the next. 2017 was a year of quite high precipitation. 2018 was very low precipitation. 2019 it went back up again. 2020, 2021 are, are both low rainfall. Uh, so we have both. Uh, interannual and uh, seasonal variations. And uh, the precipitation is controlled by these atmospheric rivers. This uh, animation here shows one of the atmospheric rivers hitting California in, in 2017. Uh, this, this caused huge amounts of rainfall in, in a large part of Northern California. And in fact, uh, between 30 and 50% of all the rainfall in California, it, it comes in these large atmospheric rivers. So uh, the details of exactly where the river hits uh, can be very hard to predict uh, much in advance. Uh, so we often get only a few days of warning about exactly what parts are gonna get these, these large amounts of water. And it, we don't know for sure what, how much is going to fall uh, in any one place. So atmospheric rivers are, are a big part of uh, West Coast rainfall. They are effect in, in other parts of the world too, but the uh, Pacific is uh, one of the most outstanding places for atmospheric rivers. And that then also affects the, uh, the overall rainfall, of whether the atmospheric rivers are, are strong or, or weak. Uh, this is a, a these are the drought maps of California produced by the uh, Drought uh, Monitoring uh, Agency, the USGA. Uh, 2015 was extremely dry, 2016 somewhat uh, slightly wetter. 2017 had so much precipitation, it actually almost completely erased the drought, but then we went back into drought in 2018. 2019 was wet again, then 2020, 2021, and uh, 2022 were, were back into drought again. So we had these strong variations of precipitation with time uh, in the state of California that uh, then affect the rate of landslide motion. So uh, one of the things that we've been looking at is uh, how the this historic uh, drought of 2015-2016 uh, 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 compares with the extremely wet year of 2017. We use a number of uh, methods to map uh, landslides uh, in California and other places. Uh, one of the main methods here is uh, SOAR data. In California, we had the advantage of being close to the area where we have the NASA JPL uh, UAV SOAR system that's uh, based here in California. So it's uh, easy access to collect data over the landslides of California with the airborne radar system that flies on a NASA airplane. Even though it's called UAV SOAR, it's actually a flown on a piloted plane. This gives us very high resolution, spatial resolution. It's an L-band system, so it has excellent coherence. Uh, it does, we generally get about two to four acquisitions per year with that system. The, we also use a lot of satellites. Uh, as I mentioned, we use uh, Copernicus Sentinel-1 uh, <clears throat> primarily today. That's the, uh, since 2015. 
with the two satellites operating, they get the six day repeat and with that one in the time interval where we only have Sentinel 1A, we have 12 day repeat. The resolution is much coarser. Uh, it's about uh, two and a half meters in the range direction or, or cross track and 14 meters in the long track direction due to the um, mode that they use for the radar. Uh, we use uh, a, a radar package called uh, the INSAR Scientific Computing Environment that was developed at JPL uh, uh, called ICE uh, with an abbreviation. And uh, so the SAR processing that uh, of the data that we use uh, from the ARIA project uh, we uses this ICE software to do the uh, INSAR processing. Uh, that ICE software is uh, on GitHub and uh, fully open and available, but it's somewhat complicated to use. So we're going to be uh, using the pre-processed data. And then we use uh, this um, time series software called uh, uh, MintPy, which stands for the Miami INSAR time series software in Python. Uh, and that's a uh, uh, software to process the time series of interferograms after the interferograms are processed. And then there's other uh, methods to map landslides that are uh, using um, optical uh, images, uh, uh, repeat pass uh, a planet or, or other optical images and LIDAR, uh, which can give very high resolution uh, digital elevation models. And those are, are excellent ways to confirm what we see on the uh, SAR, INSAR data and uh, better uh, map the landslide motion and confirm the uh, extents. So this is a uh, uh, results that we uh, did some years ago. This was some of a paper that uh, by Handwerger, Al Handwerger led and with my help uh, on the Mud Creek landslide that I showed earlier. That uh, Mud Creek landslide, uh, we ha had be, uh, were able to com combine uh, both the UAV SAR data and the Sentinel 1 data to see the full three dimensional uh, land motion. Uh, by combining uh, the three data sets. Uh, that gave us a, 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 a way to measure how the, the ground surface was moving a full three-dimensional uh, direction. And that allowed us to uh, better understand how the, the land slide was moving uh, on the surface and, and estimate what the thickness of the, the land slide was at depth. That's something that uh, is more advanced technique that's av available when we have this uh, UAV SAR data. And this is just another animation of the time series of the UAV SAR data on the left here that shows how the motion increased uh, with uh, in the wet season of 2016, then went back to a lower, uh, slower level, and then increased again in 2017. Over here on the right, there is a the uh, time series uh, shown with time uh, compared to the precipitation, the velocity here in the middle panel shows that that increase in the uh, early part of of 2016 in the in the winter or the wet season, and then uh, the huge increase in 2017 when we had that much higher precipitation, and at some point uh, the, in 2017 the the gradual motion uh, turned into a catastrophic collapse that then uh, wiped out the, the California Highway 1 here. And the uh, publication is uh, listed down here at the bottom uh, in 2019. Another, so what we're going to be talking about today is using pre-processed interferograms uh, that were processed by the uh, JPL Caltech uh, Advanced Rapid Imaging and Analysis, or ARIA, project. Uh, they produced these uh, interferograms, uh, standard uh, systematically processed interferograms. This was done in part for the Getting Ready for NISAR project that NASA sponsored. 
uh, and these uh, are using Sentinel-1 data uh, that has been acquired uh, frequently over California and other places to uh, systematically process uh, interferograms and put them in a data format that's quite similar to the data format uh, that we would use for NISAR data. So this is why this is a good example of a, a data set that's going to be very similar to the NISAR data in the, in the future, uh, but it is not from NISAR and it's from the C-band uh, Sentinel-1 uh, data. Sentinel-1 does have a 12-day repeat that's the same as NISAR will have, uh, so it gives us a good uh, idea of what kind of uh, things we'll have from NISAR, and it has this, uh, roughly the same uh, pixel spacing that we'll have from the NISAR uh, data sets. And so the data are processed to what we call geocoded unwrapped interferograms. I mentioned earlier this unwrapping process that is necessary to do the advanced uh, processing and the interferograms have also been geocoded or put into a, a long uh, a data spacing. And that allows us to then do the time series analysis from this data set. The special uh, uh, HDF5 uh, data format uh, that we use for this data set uh, requires some special tools. Uh, to use to, to convert the data into a format that we can use in the data processing. And that's <clears throat> available from this ARIA tools. And we'll be talking uh, uh, more about ARIA tools, uh, but this is another uh, open source, uh, fully uh, free and open data uh, software data set uh, with this documentation to show how to use the uh, ARIA tools to take the these um, uh, geocode unwrapped interferograms and, and convert them to a format that we can use with the uh, MintPy. Uh, <clears throat> Al Handwerger and, and I, and, and uh, we processed uh, uh, the ARIA data sets for a large part of California and produced this new map of uh, landslides within uh, a large part of California. Because this is Sentinel-1 C-band data, it only works in the areas of uh, moderate to low vegetation. Uh, so there are likely a number of landslides in the extreme northwest of California that we could not see with the with the Sentinel-1 interferometry. But we are able to get this excellent uh, map of uh, landslides over a good part of California. And this enlargement over here on the right is a, a map of uh, the Portuguese Bend landslide that we're going to be talking about in, in uh, more detail later. It's just off the uh, coast of, uh, at, right out the coastline of um, the Palos Verdes Peninsula next to Los Angeles. And uh, using this, even though this, uh, these Geocoded unwrapped interferograms were processed at a moderate resolution of 90 meters. Even though these uh, interferograms are processed at a 90 meter resolution, uh, they are we were able to map uh, 247 active landslides across California, uh, which will be, of course be only the larger landslides, not some of the smaller ones. Uh, this is just a, a a look at the uh, time series from the, the Portuguese Bend landslide in uh, Southern California next to uh, Los Angeles. Uh, and we can see in the red line here, uh, the time series of motion from the uh, Portuguese Bend landslide uh, with the blue line being the precipitation. Large precipitation in 2017 and 2019 also caused uh, significant increases in the landslide motion. Although there was a, a clear uh, time lag in both cases, it takes some time for the water to get through this quite thick landslide. And these results were published just a few months ago in uh, geophysical research letters in this uh, publication that's listed here. 
This is uh, for uh, an area of Los Angeles where the uh, annual precipitation is about 300 millimeters a year or about one foot uh, of rain, much uh, less than some parts of California, but, but more than other parts. So uh, this is to give some more uh, detail about the Portuguese Ben landslide, because that's gonna be uh, what we use for the um, demonstration today. Portuguese bend landslide was a, a it's a slow moving landslide that's on this uh, peninsula that sticks out from the, the coastline of uh, Southern California. Uh, it's a, a bedrock massif that sticks up uh, quite uh, substantial elevation. If you've ever flown out of LAX, you've seen this uh, funny um, hill sticking up out of, uh, out of the, the coastline. That's the uh, Palos Verdes Peninsula. Uh, and <clears throat> the southwest uh, side of that uh, peninsula has this landslide on it. It's been active since 1955. Uh, they were building a road uh, uh, along that side of the Palos Verdes Peninsula. And they uh, <laughs> apparently when they were doing the construction, they, they reactivated a, a previous landslide and it's been moving continuously uh, basically since 1955 when they when they caused it to, uh, to start moving again. But it originally had been formed uh, some years before that. We, we don't know all the details of exactly when it started. Uh, there's these um, roads that still cross parts of the landslide. Um, this uh, lower picture shows how the the, the road uh, has to be continuously uh, re repaved uh, because of the ongoing motion of the landslide. There's also some scarps that have formed where the uh, over here on the right side of this lower picture, there's some scarps where the the landslide has formed a head scarp, and it's. Uh, destroyed homes. Uh, apparently, over the time, 140 homes have been destroyed, and they spent millions of dollars to repair roads and water pipes and stormwater drains and lots of other things to try to keep the effects of this landslide from uh, from affecting the infrastructure in the area. The landslide uh, has two main uh, components. Uh, there's the, the light um, part, the light yellow uh, on this map are the inactive parts of the landslide that have not been reactivated uh, at the present time. Uh, there's a number of other places where it had these landslides in, on the peninsula, but the biggest one is this Portuguese Bend landslide. The, brown polygon here is the area that's actively moving today. Uh, and that's where we uh, are going to be seeing the interferograms. And if you can see on this uh, satellite image that there is actually a dense uh, coverage of houses over most of the rest of the uh, of Palos Verdes Peninsula. It's a very popular place to live. It's a uh, Got a nice sea breeze, and some places have good uh, views. Uh, but there's no houses on the <laughs> active part of the landslide because it's moving too quickly to to build a house. And uh, the the active part of the landslide has an area of about uh, uh, one square kilometer. It has variable thickness, and some parts of it are moving faster than others. Uh, some parts of the are moving up to 18 meters per year uh, at times. Other parts are moving uh, a meter a year or, or even just a, a few centimeters per year. Uh, in the early part of the time interval, the, 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 the core part of the active part of the landslide moved 150 meters uh, over 50 years. Uh, that, is a large amount of motion, obviously not possible to build a road that, at that rate. Uh, in the last 20 years, it's moved around uh, 20 meters with a slightly slower rate, um, but still enough where, where this roads that, that cross the landslide have to be repaired uh, frequently. 
And this is a, a, a LIDAR from the USGS uh, giving the a detailed topography of the area. You can see the landslide, the active part of the landslide, it gives this hummocky uh, surface due to the ongoing deformation of the surface. This uh, road is visible here that, that crosses the landslide. Um, and that's the road that has to keep being um, repaired. The main part of the landslide here is called uh, called the Portuguese Bend landslide, and then they, they use a different name, Avalone Cove, for this other one to the left and the flying triangle. I don't know where they got that name from, uh, for this little section to the east. And this is a this is an ongoing thing that it's right in the middle of an uh, area of, of significant population. You can see even on this uh, this lidar gives details where you can actually see the blocks of of, uh, of individual lots. So today we're going to be using the as a, the Aria tools uh, software to prepare the data set and take that Aria. Uh, those ARIA geocoded unwrapped interferograms and convert them to a format that's able to load into MintPy. And then we use the, the MintPy software to do the time series analysis. And this is just a, a, a results that, uh, that Al Hanberger did for his, uh, with the, uh, the ARIA tools in MintPy from a previous analysis. Uh, this is showing the average velocity from 2015 to 2020. And this is the time interval that we're going to be analyzing today uh, using the, um, <clears throat> the time series analysis. And these are uh, this uh, reference point uh, over here on the right is the point that's assumed to be stable. And the, the circle with the yellow circle around it uh, is the point where we're, it's plotted uh, with the line of sight displacement on the left here. Uh, you can see the velocity varies with the increases in uh, after the rainy seasons. In 2017, it had been dry for several years, uh, so it took some several months for the the velocity of the landslide to increase. It took uh, a while for the water to get down through the landslide and start making it move faster. But the 2019 uh, uh, rainfall uh, caused uh, uh, the landslide to, to increase in more quickly because uh, it, it hadn't been so dry uh, for a long time before. it. So this, this is the kind of uh, time series analysis that we can do with this uh, uh, MintPy and uh, ARIA datasets. So uh, now we're going to be going to the demonstration and how to do uh, how to access the uh, datasets, uh, how to uh, open them and uh, and put them into the uh, SAR interferometry time series analysis uh, for through with MintPy and ARIA tools. This will be a processing a demonstration with using a, a Jupyter notebook. Uh, so uh, we'll be ending the slide uh, presentation at this time and going to a Jupyter notebook. Thank you. Okay, so now we're ready to do the uh, demonstration part of this uh, webinar. This is a, a Jupyter notebook. The uh, recording for this will be on the, uh, the website within 48 hours and the uh, notebook itself and instructions for how to install the required software uh, if you want to run this on your own computer uh, will be available on the website uh, as well so this is uh using uh the in the MintPy software to uh, analyze the time series from this ARIA data products. And so it's Jupyter Notebook is a, a, a way to uh, interact with a Python uh, environment. I installed this Python environment using Anaconda. 
I'm running on it on a Mac, but uh, Anaconda should be able to run this uh, same software on um, Windows and Linux. This is software should run on, on both Windows and Linux in addition to the Macintosh operating system. So uh, this is based on uh, a time series analysis uh, notebook that was originally developed uh, by the uh, MintPy uh, group uh, and then uh, modified by, by me uh, to focus on this uh, landslide uh, next to, to Los Angeles at, at uh, Port of Palos Verdes Peninsula. Uh, the original notebook is available from the MintPy uh, website uh, using the link that uh, you'll be able to get to from the uh, the notebook here. Uh, we're going to be, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to be using this Caltech uh, JPL ARIA uh, pre-processed interferograms uh, that were processed for getting ready for NISAR project. Uh, it's a service displacement uh, time series, uh, a number of interferograms that are in a data format that are very similar to what's going to be the level two NISAR geocoded unwrapped uh, interferograms. Uh, GUNW stands for geocoded unwrapped. Uh, and they're a, a data format that's very similar to what we're going to be using for NISAR a data product. So this uh, training should be applicable to uh, using NISAR data in, in about a year uh, from now when when that's launched in 2024. The uh, ARIA interferograms are, are all stored at the NASA Alaska Satellite Facility DAC, ASF DAC, and they're uh, fully openly accessible uh, to anybody. Uh, they're only processed for certain areas of the of the world uh, for this as a demonstration product uh, for uh, getting ready for NISAR. So there's good coverage in California and uh, some places on the east coast of the U.S. over Tibet. Uh, I think some places over Saudi Arabia and uh, a few uh, Hawaii and a few other places around the world, but it's not systematically processed everywhere. The NISAR data will be systematically processed to uh, these geocode and unwrap data all, uh, globally. Uh, so the, in the future, we'll have uh, a global interferogram on data sets. And then we're going to be, uh, so we first uh, have to use these ARIA tools. The, the original uh, data files are in a, a somewhat complicated data format. <clears throat> We have to use ARIA tools to uh, convert them to a format that uh, the MintPy software can then uh, analyze. And then we use, uh, so that first do the ARIA tools processing. In this particular case, the ARIA tools processing takes, uh, especially the download of the data takes several hours to run. I'm gonna run that for you live here. I'm gonna use a, a pre-processed uh, data set where the ARIA tools uh, processing steps have been pre-run in advance, and the the, the pre-processed <laughs> uh, pre-post-processed data is was then stored in an S3 bucket uh, of the uh, Alaska Satellite Facility. Uh, it's in the uh, Amazon Web Services, uh, and we uh, just download the data that's already been processed. This uh, Bucket is now openly accessible, and in the past they had limited it to their open SAR lab uh, facility, uh, but now it's open to anybody, and you can download this data uh, to do this uh, demonstration on your own uh, without having to uh, uh, to use the ARIA tools package if you want to skip that step. If you want to use uh, do a different area, you'll have to do your own ARIA tools uh, processing. This this uh, subset only covers the uh, Palos Verdes Peninsula. So the first step we have to do is uh, doing the usual setup of all the uh, importing different modules that we're going to be using for this software uh, into the uh, Jupyter Notebook. Then the next cell here, we uh, download this pre-staged data. I, I already did this download, so it, it saw that the data was already uh, downloaded, but 
Uh, this, this particular cell uh, uses either AWS command here uh, to download the, the stack data pre-processed or wget, either one of those will work. Uh, this S3 bucket is available. Uh, S3 is a, is, a, is a type of storage in the cloud. Uh, uh, this downloads the uh, pre-processed stack uh, file to the local directory and then un unzips it here uh, into the directory here. So the um, once we have uh, downloaded the data, these subsets are the uh, the actual uh, files that have been in process with the ARIA tools. There's um, the unwrap phase, the uh, Look angle, the radar incidence angle, connected components, the coherence estimate. All these are the components of the interferogram that have been uh, separated into files for each one of the uh, interferograms. There's a total of, um, I think it's around 400 interferograms here. Uh, if we look in this directory, there's a, there's a huge number of files. Each one of these is an interferogram. Uh, so the next step is. Uh, these these commented uh, this uh, little hash uh, character means that that line has been commented out. Uh, this is the ARIA download command that downloads the data from this track over the area of Los Angeles. Uh, the next step is the ARIA time series setup that you have to run to convert those uh, downloaded data products. Uh, to uh, the format that we can use for all these separate files uh, that we load into MintPy. So these are the commands that you could use to uh, regenerate this data set that I had pre-staged. Uh, the first uh, ARIA TS setup is, is for the large area of Los Angeles. Uh, if you want to cover a larger area, uh, for this particular demonstration, I've used a, this second uh, RASTS setup command uh, that covers a smaller uh, box so that we uh, can do the processing more quickly. <clears throat> so the uh, the next step, and uh, because I've already pre-processed, uh, done this pre-processing uh, with uh, ARIA tools, is to go directly to MintPy. The main MintPy program that we use for the analysis is called Small Baseline App. Uh, small baseline is uh, the name for the algorithm that we use for the time series analysis that where we assuming that the, the baseline between the uh, radar acquisitions is small, which is, is always true for the Sentinel-1 satellite. Uh, there were other satellites where the, uh, the orbits were not constrained to be so short. Uh, that's the, the main algorithm we're using here is called the small baseline uh, subset uh, analysis. And that's why the, the small baseline app is the, the name of the program that we use in MintPy. Uh, you can just choose uh, this command, small baseline app uh, dash dash help to uh, to see the usage of the, the small baseline app. and it has a, lot, a number of um, options specifying uh, which which uh, directory and, and uh, so the main uh, function is you want to give this template file that's the input file that specifies how to do the processing or what where the data is what what uh, other processing parameters we want to use um, and then there's a number of steps here. Uh, these are all the different steps that, are, that can be done in this workflow of uh, small baseline processing. We'll uh, be using, uh, executing these steps separately to uh, have a, an idea of what the steps are doing. So the first thing um, that is the this template file or configuration file, uh, this file called LASEN, DT71, that's a Los Angeles Sentinel descending track 71 uh, configuration file. We can take a look at that file, double click on it here in the Jupyter Lab interface. It shows us the file. 
here is where we specify that we're using uh, data from the ARIA processing. Uh, we could also get data from SNAP or from, uh, from processing with ICE ourselves, uh, from Gamma or RIPAC. Those are all the different uh, processing, uh, INSAR processing systems that are supported by MintPy. Uh, this is showing us where the files are, uh, what's the reference scene. Uh, most of these other uh, parameters are set to uh, defaults. The, the key thing down here is that we're, we're going to exclude some certain interferograms that I looked at in the past and saw that they were uh, quite noisy. And uh, this, we're going to set the maximum temporal baseline. That means we don't want to use interferograms that have time intervals of more than 360 days. Uh, with the C-band data in, uh, uh, with some vegetation, we don't want to use the very long interferograms because those will be uh, less coherent. And those will uh, make the time series analysis much worse. The, and then finally, the, we're specifying what the, where the reference point is. Time series analysis is always done with respect to a reference point. As I mentioned a long time ago, we never have the absolute phase for uh, SAR interferometry. It's always relative to a certain uh, location. And this location for the time series analysis is, is where we assume that the displacements are zero. That's just an assumption. And that's we have to make an assumption of where the reference point is. So the next step uh, is to just set up the directory. Uh, this just copies the, uh, that uh, file to the, uh, to the MintPy directory. We do all it, you're gonna do all this processing and I'm uh, under a subdirectory called MintPy. And now we're running uh, the small baseline app with that, um, Specification file la send dt 71txt and we want to telling it to do the the load data step. So in this case, I've already uh, run this before, but it it, it runs so it's telling me that it's uh, right here. <clears throat> uh, rerunning the 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 loading of the data. Uh, it's found 439 interferograms. And the subset that we've uh, extracted using ARIA tools is 300 by 360 pixels. It's a small area of the full interferogram that's uh, just covering the Palos Verdes Peninsula uh, for the purposes of having a, a more efficient um, demonstration. So at the end of this uh, loading step, we have two output files. If we can see here, uh, those are put into the uh, input directory. Uh, yeah. There's an input subdirectory here. Uh, the inputs are the uh, interferogram stack. IFG, IFGram stack.h5, and then the geometry information. This is all the information about the geometry of the, um, the radar uh, stack. Uh, .h5 is a means that these are HDF5 files, and that's the uh, data format that we use in MintPy. The uh, ARIA, getting ready for NISAR and, and, and NISAR uh, interferogram files are also in an HDF5 uh, format, but it's a, it's a, it's a generic uh, format that can be used for different purposes. Uh, this is the MintPy uh, HDF5 format. We can use the uh, MintPy command info.py to get the information about any one of these files. We run that on the interferogram stack file. It tells us that this is uh, a geocoded uh, stack. All the uh, input interferograms are geocoded. It, I mean, I can also do uh, time series analysis on uh, <clears throat> interferograms that are in uh, radar coordinates. Uh, 
uh, gives a bunch of information about the latitude and longitude limits, the spacing of the file, all the different uh, uh, parameters. We have the uh, specification of the perpendicular baseline for each one of the interferograms, the coherence for each one of the interferograms, connected components, layer, the, the date of each interferogram, whether that interferogram is marked to be dropped from the time series analysis, and the unwrapped phase. The geometry file has uh, additional information about the uh, geometry. It has the, uh, the line of sight uh, is specified as, in the, uh, as an azimuth angle and the incidence angle. Uh, that's the um, two angles that define uh, the, the vector from the satellite to the ground or the ground to the satellite. Uh, it has the height from the DEM and a water mask that uh, is telling it whether it's water or not. Because we're looking at a peninsula here, we want to avoid doing any time series analysis over the ocean where the uh, in interferogram is not going to be uh, effectively, it's going to be completely incoherent. So the first step is to run this uh, modify network um, command that goes through and drops the interferograms that we told it to drop. It's dropping these 30 interferograms uh, uh, in addition to the interferograms that are uh, longer, that we specified in the input file, plus another 71 interferograms that had time intervals of more than 360 days. So that's a total of 98 interferograms that are removed, and we're going to keep uh, 341. Uh, that means because of the way these interferograms were dropped, uh, two of these dates are going to be uh, removed from the time series because there's no interferogram connecting them to the other uh, other dates in the time series. So uh, the next uh, step uh, runs uh, uh, these plots. These are the network uh, of uh, interferograms. Each one of these lines is connecting adjacent dates. These dates with the uh, gray circles were the ones that were removed because they were no longer connected uh, by uh, interferograms that we're going to use. Uh, this next plot is the coherence uh, for each one of the pairs of interferograms. Uh, you can see back in uh, 2015, early 2016, they were only acquiring data with the Sentinel 1A satellite that with a, a shorter, I mean, a longer repeat interval, so those interferograms are longer uh, and more widely spaced. And then more recently, they've been acquiring data um, on the six-day repeat. So suddenly, uh, around 2017, they, in this particular area, they started acquiring six-day repeats with Sentinel-1A and 1B. Uh, the uh, Green, I mean, the uh, orange part of this plot shows the minimum coherence within the, the interferogram, and the, the blue shows the maximum coherence of the interferogram. Uh, you can see that in, during the winter, uh, there can be a lower coherence uh, due to uh, rainfall affecting the coherence. Uh, this next plot shows the uh, coherence matrix. Each one of these little squares is, the, uh, is a single interferogram. Uh, the ones below the line are the interferograms that uh, all the interferograms and the ones above are the ones that are, are uh, that we're using in the analysis. These uh, interferograms that were more than a year long are been not not going to be used. Um, this sort of an advanced uh, method for looking at how the coherence varies with uh, interferogram length. And this is showing every possible pair that we have from interferograms. Uh, the uh, interferograms that are dashed are the ones that we decided to remove because they have long time intervals or uh, were specified as, as bad. Then the ones that are solid are the ones that are, uh, are we're using the analysis. Uh, we've set a threshold here of uh, average spatial coherence of uh, 0 0.5. Uh, as, as the transition between blue and and uh, orange, all these are uh, showing blue because there's a pretty good in 
coherence due to the fact that this is largely urbanized area, uh, not uh, not not uh, forest. So the next step is to uh, generate a mask of the uh, from the connected components and from the the coherence. You see this this is uh, connected components is one of the the outputs of the phase unwrapping process that tells us how well the the unwrap how reliably the unwrapped phase is. And we can see that uh, the blue area here is where the connected components are were marked as not connected. That's the ocean. There's also some areas on land where the connected components are are were shown as as poor. And those are areas where the unwrapped phase was unreliable in at least some of the interferographs. Then we uh, set the reference point. Uh, that I specified that in the input file, as I mentioned earlier. This goes through uh, and finds out which pixel in the uh, file was used that uh, latitude and longitude that I specified. So it's at uh, pixel 106, 168. So that's the uh, the pixel that we're going to use for the uh, time series reference. The next step is to actually uh, take all those interferograms and uh, estimate, do a, what we call a network, small baseline network inversion. And whereas a pair of uh, an interferogram pair is the deformation just within that time interval, we can do this network inversion and get it back to estimate what's the uh, the deformation on a given displacement on a given date. So that's what this uh, inver network inversion uh, step does because we have a small area here. It, it runs very quickly. Uh, and the output file is uh, this uh, time series time series.hdf5 that's the uh, the displacement on the on each date of the time series uh, we estimate the temporal coherence this is coherence measured in time rather than in space and we also get a, a, a file of the number of interferograms that had a measurement uh, for each one of the pixels So the next step is we can take that um, time series and then calculate what's the velocity of the, uh, of the pixels. So we're just doing a very simple linear fit. It's a polynomial order one. It's going to do a, a linear fit for every uh, pixel in the, in the interferogram. And this next step, uh, the output of that is this velocity dot uh, h5 file. That's the output of the velocity fit program uh, step. And we can use these commands here to uh, look at that velocity. Make a plot. So now we can see this is the uh, mean velocity over the five-year interval of the, of the time series that we uh, are analyzing here. And the Portuguese Ben landslide is uh, standing out here as the uh, area moving with a blue uh, color here. Blue is a uh, motion away from the satellite. In this particular case, it's a descending track. The satellite was east of this area, uh, so the uh, the vector from the ground to the satellite is up and to the east. That means that uh, negative motion is uh, either down or west. In this case, the landslide is moving uh, both downward and to the southwest, and both the horizontal and vertical motion is adding together to uh, give this uh, line of sight motion. Now, that's one of the key uh, things to remember with uh, interferograms. And, and time series analysis of interferograms is this is not uh, either vertical or horizontal. It's a mixture of vertical and horizontal in the radar line of sight direction. Uh, we can also see over here on the eastern side of this subset, there's an area uh, that's going towards the radar. 
And this actually ends uh, is an area of uh, Long Beach, uh, the port of Long Beach and the, the city of Long Beach in California is uh, both a, a major port in on the west coast of the United States and a, an oil field. There's a huge oil field that's directly underneath the city of Long Beach. And they are actually injecting water uh, into this oil field as they extract the oil and in this particular in this time interval they're they're injecting more water than they were extracting and the ground surface was going up so uh, this somewhat uh, unexpected uh, area is actually moving upward whereas the landslide is moving down uh, and to the southwest so the next steps uh, we now that we have this velocity map is to try to understand a little bit more about what the uh, possible errors are in the in the velocities. Uh, the uh, one of the things to look at is the uh, average spatial coherence. We talked about coherence before. Uh, this is taking the coherence of all the different uh, pairs and then just averaging averaging all the pairs so this is showing you the uh, the average of the spatial spatial coherence that we talked about earlier uh, most of this area is urbanized uh, so it's high coherence in the area of the port of long beach and uh, and uh, the port of los angeles there's a lot of uh, containers and uh, ships and uh, trucks and all kinds of stuff moving around uh, so the coherence is actually very low in a lot of the, the port area uh, due to uh, things being moved. I mean, this is the biggest port on the west coast of, uh, of North America. So it's a, there's a lot of stuff moving through here. Uh, it's not a, uh, while the buildings in the port are, are, are uh, staying constant, the, there's other stuff moving around. So the, the spatial coherence is low. Uh, we can also do this uh, temporal coherence that I mentioned uh, is calculated uh, instead of by using uh, the correlation in space, it uses the correlation in time for each pixel. Uh, so the next step is to calculate the temporal coherence and plot that. And the temporal coherence is, is usually quite similar to the spatial coherence uh, because the same processes that uh, uh, change the coherence on, on a spatial uh, scale, also change the coherence in time. It's uh, also very clear here that the, the, all this uh, activity in the port is, is causing low coherence in, in most of the port of uh, Los Angeles and Long Beach, whereas the uh, urbanized area of uh, Palos Verdes and, and adjacent parts of Long Beach uh, and Los Angeles are, are good good for temporal coherence. Um, the uh, the INSAR in the area of the landslide is is a slightly lower temporal coherence, but it's still uh, good temporal coherence. This square here is uh, on all these plots is the uh, reference location. So uh, at that reference location, the uh, velocity and all the displacements are defined to be zero. It also, uh, we also want to make sure that that reference location is in a place where there's good coherence, because otherwise, uh, noise in the uh, reference location will get uh, affect the time series analysis. One of the other uh, things that MintPy does is calculate the uh, velocity standard deviation. Uh, we do a linear fit to the uh, velocity here, uh, and it estimates what's the uh, uh, standard deviation or, or, or RMS uh, relative to that fit, uh, and makes a makes another layer that's that. So that's uh, this is the uh, plot of that uh, velocity standard deviation or estimated uncertainty. Uh, you'll notice that the uh, under estimated uncertainty is basically uh, near zero at the, the point of the uh, reference location. That's all as expected because we define the 
displacements to be zero there, and uh, adjacent areas are having very little error relative to that dis reference point. Uh, you can see that there's a, an area in blue here where the re uh, velocity errors are low. That's actually the area of ho relatively high elevation on, on Palos Verdes Peninsula because our reference point is at high elevation. Uh, the areas of similar elevation have the same amount of atmosphere uh, above them, and areas at lower elevation have a, a different variation of atmosphere. This area has a, a large amount of uh, marine layer, uh, uh, atmospheric variation and humidity uh, on different dates. Uh, so as we get to uh, different elevations, uh, the there's an increased component of um, atmospheric errors, and that there gives us an uncertainty in the velocity standard deviation. There's also an increase in velocity error in the area of the landslide due to the fact that uh, there's a disruption of the land surface and, and, and possibly uh, some uh, small-scale unwrapping errors. So this is an important thing to look at. This gives it a, an idea of what's the uncertainty in the measurements of, from your uh, INSAR time series, uh, and it's converted to centimeters per year uh, of uncertainty. We can also use uh, a mint by function to plot a, a cross section or transect through the uh, through the velocity map. That's, this dashed line shows the the location of the transect, and this uh, plot on the right here shows uh, the velocity along that transect. We can see the landslide motion here is uh, up to uh, two and a half centimeters per year in the radar line of sight. The total motion is actually much larger because most of the landslide motion is is uh, southward. The radar line of sight is to the up and to the east. We're not seeing a, a lot of that southward motion. We're only seeing uh, a component of it that's in the radar line of sight. Uh, but that even that is is two and a half centimeters per year in the in the middle of the active part of the landslide. And you could choose other points. We, we specify the point here, the starting uh, latitude and longitude of the transect and the end latitude and longitude of the transect. You can easily uh, change that to be wherever uh, you want to do your uh, transect. The other thing we can do now that we have this time series is to actually try different time functions. Uh, for the purposes of this uh, demonstration, we're, we're uh, not going to spend a lot of time on different time functions, but we can use this uh, tool in MintPy called TSView. This is the time series viewing uh, function. Uh, when we uh, access this inside a notebook, we can use this TSView uh, uh, Python call. But you can also run this from the command line uh, using this command that's uh, written out here uh, by calling the uh, the tsview.py, uh, and this that gives us this map here. This is the uh, map of the total displacement. Uh, we can use the, in this particular widget. We can uh, use this uh, scroll bar to to see the total displacement uh, with time. Uh, uh, oh, I forgot to mention earlier, um, not only is there a, a reference point for a time series analysis, we also have it to have a reference date. And the reference date also has uh, zero uh, displacement uh, by uh, definition. So uh, in this particular uh, time series analysis, I've used the very first date on uh, the 5th, uh, April 4th, May 14th in, in 2015. Uh, as the reference date. So if we look at the reference date, the, the displacements are all zero. And then if we move this scroll bar, uh, we can see the the displacement increasing with time uh, as we go through this five years of, of uh, time series up to uh, March 12th of 2020. 
there's there's more data now on this particular uh, version of the uh, subset of the data only goes into 2020. There are data up through uh, 2021 that's been processed uh, even into 2022 in, in the ARIA uh, geocoded unwrapped data files if you want to do a further analysis. But now we can also use this uh, time series view uh, function by to click the mouse on, on a given point and go to this upper plot. And this shows us then the, uh, let me zoom out a little bit uh, so we can see the map and the uh, plot at the same time. When I click the mouse on the landslide, we can see that uh, rapid motion of the, of the landslide. And this, the point that I happened to click on, it was about two centimeters per year, uh, 1.8. Uh, if I click on, a, on the land nearby, you can see that it's basically zero deformation. The, the rest of the Palo Verdes Peninsula is uh, not moving, fortunately for the people that have their houses there. Over here in Long Beach, uh, there is this uplift due to the uh, water injection of the oil field. It's actually going up by about one centimeter per year. Um, I don't know the, the details of what they're doing there, but it's clearly they're doing something and it's going on for, for years. Uh, we can also look at the, go back to the landslide and, and see that there is some variation with time in the uh, the landslide motion, any one pixel will have some amount of noise on it. Uh, so often what we do is take uh, do some further analysis to take the average of, of some number of pixels uh, to better understand how the uh, velocity uh, varies with time. Uh, so uh, with this time series, now that we have the time series analyzed, uh, fortunately, this landslide is not uh, accelerating. It's not uh, likely to do a, a catastrophic collapse, at least as far as we, what we've seen so far. Uh, but if we uh, we see there is this increase of, of at the end of 2020, that was when we had another wet year. Um, we probably we want to process the the next data for the 2021 and 2022, I think you'll see that it's then slowing down again because we had much less rainfall in those years than we had in 2019 and 2020. Uh, this is uh, what we can learn by doing time series analysis of landslides. So that's, uh, this is the result of our, our uh, time series analysis. And I think that's, uh, we're going to end the uh, demonstration. There's some additional just uh, reference material, uh, the reference to the Yun Jun's paper on the MintPy uh, software, small baseline INSAR time series analysis. It's published online. The, the software is in the uh, uh, GitHub repository. Uh, the ARIA tools are in the ARIA GitHub repository. Uh, and all links to these things will be uh, provided and, and the in, uh, installation tools in the uh, RSET uh, training site. So I think that's it for today. And uh, we'll be answering uh, some questions in the live session. Thank you very much, Dr. Fueling, for that excellent presentation and demonstration. Uh, very interesting to see what can be done with INSAR to detect those small land surface movements uh, related to landslides. Uh, please, to participants, if you have any questions, please type them in the uh, uh, questions box and we will answer them in the order that they were received. We have been gathering the questions posted so far into a Google Doc and we will share this Google Doc with you shortly on screen. And uh, we will um, answer all of the questions and we will post this talk on the RSET uh, page for this webinar series in a couple of days. If you have any questions about the material presented today, 
please don't hesitate to contact Dr. Eric Fueling through the email posted here. Also, uh, we've posted the uh, link to the RSET training page as well as our RSET's Twitter handle. That ends the second session of this three-part SAR webinar series. I'd like to thank all of the participants and I especially like to thank Dr. Eric Fielding for the uh, great presentation today. We will now start the question and answer session. Please, if you have any questions and you haven't typed it in the question box, please uh, go ahead and do so. We will get to all questions. If we run out of time, we will respond all questions on the Google Doc. Great. So uh, uh, we will get to all questions. If we don't answer them live, uh, we will be answer the, answering them on the Google Doc. So let's start with the first question. Uh, flooding, especially in riverine systems, is not a flat surface. Is there a way to estimate the elevation of a water surface, say in a canal or river valley, as it flows downstream? Go ahead, Dr. Fielding. Yes, actually, the NASA is building, or already finished building, and is ready to launch uh, a special mission called the Surface Water and Ocean Topography Mission uh, that's presently planned to be launched in just two months. Uh, and that will use single pass interferometry, SAR interferometry. It has two radar antennas to illuminate the, the surface of, uh, of water uh, on the earth. And it will be using that to measure the elevation of water surfaces in rivers, lakes, and the oceans um, using uh, the single pass interferometry technique. Wonderful, looking, uh, very much looking forward to that mission. The next question, how can we measure the penetration of different microwave wavelengths in ice or snow? Please guide us with some insights for snow depth measure measurements with INSAR. Uh, this is not really my area of expertise. We, NASA has been uh, sponsoring uh, snow experiment studies for, with radar for many years. Uh, and uh, they've, uh, a number of scientists have been going out and doing measurements of the snow depth in the field and comparing it to radar imagery uh, measured, uh, acquired from both satellites and uh, the airborne radar systems, uh, both with uh, C-band, uh, X-band, and uh, L-band radars. So there's a lot of information about that. I, I don't know the details. Uh, I think it depends strongly on the um, uh, water content of the snow, and uh, that's uh, there's a lot of studies in that area, but I don't know all the details. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add really quickly. I, I do have some experience here, so uh, it does obviously depend on the wavelength, and uh, it is fully a function of snow wetness and snow density. So, if it's a dry snowpack at L band, you can be penetrating a couple of meters actually through a very dry. Uh, snowpack, but there are many different studies out there. Uh, okay, and and oh, and what I mentioned is just with um, amplitude; it, it's not with INSAR. Question number three: How do I select the best INSAR pairs for generation of interferograms? How do I select the perpendicular baseline and temporal baseline, and what should be the best perpendicular baseline? Well, for measuring displacements, the best perpendicular baseline is zero uh, we want uh, we want to measure displacements with the best the shortest baselines are are better uh, with modern satellites including copernicus 1a and 1b uh, and uh, the jaxa alus 2 satellites they keep the satellite orbits uh, tightly controlled so that all of the uh, pairs of uh, data or have baselines that are suitable for INSAR. Uh, you don't really have to worry about it. Uh, with some of the older satellites, you uh, need to adjust the baseline. It, just, it is proportional to the radar wavelength. So with the C-band, you probably want a baseline less than about 200 meters. And with L-band, you want a baseline less than about uh, 800 meters. Um, 
but with recent satellites, you, do, you don't need to worry about the baseline because they, they can make all the baselines usable. And that'll also be true for NISAR. The temporal baseline is a, a much more complicated uh, question because it really depends very strongly on the, the vegetation cover. As I explained earlier, the, the more vegetation you have, the faster we lose coherence with the shorter radar wavelengths. If you have a desert area with zero vegetation and no, no loose sand, a very stable surface, you can use even seven-year interferograms uh, that I processed with the, the NVSAT data in the past. Uh, there it doesn't even matter if with the short radar wavelengths, but in areas of tropical forests, a very dense forest, then uh, C-band data will lose coherence relatively quickly. Uh, in some cases, uh, with six-day intervals with where, where Sentinel-1A and 1B are operating, you may get some coherence with C-band data in the, in the tropical forests. Uh, but then longer intervals, uh, uh, even after 12 or 24 days, you very quickly lose coherence uh, at, at C-band, and therefore uh, the interferograms will not, not be usable. Uh, L-band, the coherence decreases much more slowly with time, and in most areas of tropical forest, we can use... Uh, intervals of up to six months uh, without uh, losing coherence. That's why we're building the NISAR mission with L-band to have coherence even in uh, heavily forested areas. Great. So the next question is, if precipitation largely controls landslides, is it possible to simultaneously collect SAR-based soil moisture data while collecting INSAR data? Yes, we are uh, have been working on uh, estimating soil moisture from the SAR data. Uh, we use the SAR amplitude images uh, to estimate the soil moisture uh, simultaneously with the, uh, the interferometry. As this works especially well with the uh, airborne radar system called UAV SAR that NASA operates uh, because that has a multiple, a very high res spatial resolution and uh, fully polarimetric radar that enhances the soil moisture maps. But it's also possible from space where the NISAR mission will be estimating soil moisture uh, globally at about a 200 meter spacing as part of the uh, NISAR mission, in addition to doing the, the interferometry. Okay, question number five, was land use change considered as well for the landslides? Uh, land use change does affect landslide motion uh, in, in some cases very dramatically. Um, there have been cases where irrigation of land that uh, above landslides uh, causes water to move down into the landslide and, and landslide motion to increase. Uh, that was a, a, there was a significant problem in uh, uh, one of the area near Santa Barbara uh, some, some years ago where the, uh, there was a irrigation above a landslide that caused the landslide to start moving more quickly and then eventually collapsed and took out quite a few houses. That was an unfortunate case. Uh, other cases of, uh, la of land use change is uh, the removal of vegetation, either by uh, cutting down the trees or wildfires burning uh, the vegetation. And that <clears throat> removal of vegetation often uh, leads to increased risk of uh, landslide motion and, and debris flows. Uh, so that's a, an important consideration for, for uh, a landslide risk. Question number six, how do you deal with atmospheric and topographic corrections within the interferogram? Does the time series allow us to predict beforehand whether land landslide is going to occur? And can we use ground-based INSAR and geotechnical monitoring systems in order to anticipate and mitigate the risk of these areas? 
because landslides have relatively small areas, the atmosphere corrections are not necessary uh, because the atmosphere varies over larger distances. We do need to do topographic corrections, so we have to have a topographic data set or digital elevation model to estimate the uh, topographic phase, remove that from the end, and also to do the geocoding of interferograms. Time series analysis of the slow moving landslides can be used to, to monitor how the motion is varying over time. And in some cases, we may be able to detect the acceleration of motion uh, before it leads to a catastrophic collapse. Ground-based INSAR and other geotechnical uh, systems are effectively for measuring landslides. Once we uh, know that they're, uh, if we can see on a satellite or, or airborne radar system, INSAR system that the, that landslide is, seems to be moving more quickly, then it may be worthwhile to install some ground-based uh, systems to uh, more frequently monitor the, uh, the landslide motion to see uh, how it's proceeding. Okay, question number seven about installation. Uh, this person cannot install the software from hit GitHub onto the, his, his Windows system. Is there a tutorial? Uh, I'm not very familiar with Windows, so uh, but I understand that Anaconda works well on in Windows, so I recommend using Anaconda for Windows installations. Question eight. Regarding the 247 active landslides in California, do you generate the polygons for landslide margins in addition to the geographic locations? Yes, uh, we map the outlines of these landslides as we did the analysis from the time series and the uh, landslide polygons uh, are uh, shown in the uh, paper uh, at, at some resolution. Question nine, what is the process of acquiring the displacement? I'm not quite sure what they mean by acquiring the displacement, uh, but I, the, when we do the time series analysis, we estimate the line of sight displacements uh, for each pixel uh, of, the, of the area being analyzed relative to the reference point of the time series and the reference date of the time series by doing an inversion of the displacements from all the interferograms. The interferogram displacements uh, are just measured directly from the geocode map face. All right, how about the next one, question 10, that you experiment using multiple reference points within the analysis versus just a single point to create a standard average for the spatial correlation coherence. And if so, how did how much did the coherence and correlation change when modeling the shift in landslides? Uh, well, the MintPy software is designed only to use a single reference point at a time, but you can run it, rerun the time series inversion with different reference points uh, if you want to explore this. Uh, we didn't do that for this particular analysis, but that's a, a possible way to look at the effect of what reference point you use. Okay, question 11, I'm sorry. Yeah, so the, go ahead. Okay, the next question, 11. If I wanted to prepare a similar data set for another area, not inside of those white rectangles uh, where the data has been pre-processed, is there an open source library that converts the raw data to the data structures process uh, that are processable by MintPy? Yes, you can uh, do the full uh, installation of uh, the ICE software from, from uh, GitHub and do your own uh, processing of the uh, time series, similar to what uh, the pre-processed interferograms that's uh, available. Uh, there's also the option at ASF uh, to do on-demand processing. They use a different software package called Gamma, and both of, and that is also uh, possible to load into MintPy for time series analysis. 
Question 12, is it possible to use different satellites to produce interferograms? Uh, I'm not quite sure what, they, uh, what they're asking, but uh, you can use, uh, you have to use satellites that are completely uh, uh, compatible. The Sentinel-1A and 1B satellites are identical, so they are, uh, you can make interferograms with those two satellites. But in general, you have to use uh, the same. Uh, you have to use data from the same satellite system in the same orbit. You can't mix like a Sentinel One scene with a, a Cosmos SkyMed scene, or <laughs> you can use the Cosmos SkyMed uh, constellation had four satellites, so you can use all four of the, any one of those four satellites. But it has to be a compatible. Uh, satellite in the same orbit. What are the major limitations of INSAR derived from Sentinel-1 over mountainous regions such as the Himalayas? Uh, well, the big problems in the Himalayas are that uh, the slopes are steep and they are uh, vegetated and both of those cause uh, low coherence. Uh, and that makes it difficult to unwrap the phase. And we we have looked at uh, Sentinel-1 interferometry over the Himalayas, and it's not been very effective. So uh, NISAR with the L-band radar wavelength will have much better coherence, especially with the 12-day uh, repeat interval. Great. Question number 14. Can the can INSAR be applied in uh, for monitoring open pit mines for vertical change monitoring? Um, the when when uh, the when the surface is, is mined or uh, disrupted then it'll become incoherent. We can't use the uh, repeat pass interferometry to uh, measure uh, vertical uh, change, uh, but in some cases it is possible to get uh, single pass interferometry from a satellite like uh, the Tandem X, Tand Terrasar X pair uh, to measure uh, vertical change uh, with single pass interferometry. Question 15, can I ask ARIA to process any data to GUNW products for a region of interest? At this time, we, we don't have a, a method for requesting uh, ARIA processing. Uh, this is something we're looking at in the future. Question number 16, what bands or pairs of interferograms are suitable for, for delineating lithological rock cover and how reliable will their penetration be from the surface to the rocks? Uh, a radar has been used in, to uh, map delineate different types of rocks. Uh, the radar responds to uh, the surface uh, roughness of the rocks rather than the lithology. So uh, it's more uh, information on how rough the surface is uh, in, in a, say, uh, a volcanic area, a smooth uh, volcanic flow would be a, a low radar backscatter, a rough uh, uh, lava, would have a very high radar backscatter. So in that case, uh, the radar is responding to the surface roughness uh, of the uh, radar of volcanic flows rather than the uh, details of the lithology. So you would likely want to uh, combine the radar data with optical data to get the full lithologic information. Great. Question 17, software related. Are there specific dependencies needed to be installed before installing MintPy on Jupyter Notebook? 
Yes, the mint pie uh, installation procedure sh uh, has a requirements dot uh, text file that has uh, the requirements for installing mint pie. Okay, question 18. I plan to conduct research in the UK. Is there a source of airborne SAR data that I can find for my study area, free or paid? And second question, is there a spaceborne P-band sensor I can find data for my study area? I'm not aware of uh, airborne uh, SAR data for uh, the UK. The German uh, Space Agency, DLR, has an airborne radar system. I don't know if they operate that over the UK. Um, question two, uh, there is not a, a spaceborne P-band radar at this time, uh, but the European Space Agency, ESA, is uh, planning to launch a P-band radar called Biomass. Uh, in a few years. It will have very uh, coarse resolution and not likely be useful for interferometry. Question 19. Is there, an, do you have international requests to provide such monitoring? Um, uh, there are, there are, um, companies that provide monitoring. Uh, so there are uh, value, what we call value-added companies that do uh, monitoring for in, any place in the world that uh, people want to have monitored. Question 20, how much do earthquakes affect the SAR image coherence? Also, do you notice increase, increased shifts in landslides following an earthquake event? Yes, uh, earthquakes are one of the uh, a big cause of landslide uh, motion. Uh, after large earthquakes, there are um, many, many landslides if it's an area of, of steep topo topographic relief. And uh, earthquakes also can cause a loss of, in of coherence due to the fault motion. Uh, and due to uh, damage to uh, buildings and other infrastructure. Okay, question 21. When looking at lake drainage events on ice sheets using Sentinel-1, the fringes generated are quite small. Does this mean that the confidence in surface change due to drainage is low? Um, the confidence in the surface change is proportional to the coherence. Um, so if the, the, the number of fringes is small, uh, the, the, but the coherence is high, the confidence can be uh, fairly high. Uh, you can base, normally with a, say C-band radar, you can measure uh, displacements down to about uh, a few centi a few millimeters. Uh, okay, and the last question, what will the frequency and resolution of the new SWAT imagery be? Um, uh, I don't know all the details about SWAT. Um, I'm not part of the SWAT <laughs> team. Uh, the, the SWAT uh, radar is actually using a very short radar wavelength uh, called um, KA band uh, that's even shorter than X band, about uh, one and a half centimeters. So it's using a, a very high frequency radar, but because it's single pass interferometry, it will have the high coherence. Uh, and doesn't and we can post the a link or additional information about the mission here. So, so that's it in terms of questions. We will be cleaning up this document and posting it on the training page. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone and uh, sorry we ran over. We did want to get to all of your questions. Uh, so thanks for hanging in there. Uh, uh, great thanks to Dr. Fielding and to the, the RSET team that's been working 
uh, to help put these uh, a webinar series together. Before we close, Dr. Fielding, any words from you before we close? Yes, I thank, thank people for listening to the webinar today, and I hope that uh, we have uh, NISAR data very soon to uh, improve the quality of uh, INSAR data worldwide. Thank you. Absolutely, very much looking forward to NISAR data flowing in. So um, uh, please don't forget that there is one more session associated with this webinar series. That's going to be next Thursday, October 27th. We're going to have Dr. Malin Johansson from uh, Norway. She's going to be talking about the use of SAR to detect oil spills on water. Uh, keep tuned. In terms of the homework, we will be um, uh, announcing the homework or uh, opening up the homework in the last session of this webinar series. Uh, thanks, everyone, and wishing you all a great day. Bye-bye.